Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. I am hurtling through a list of my top 50 games, and this is the third instalment, covering games 30 to 21. If you haven't checked the previous videos, they are linked in the video description below, so you might want to watch those first. If you are already up to date, let's just crack on. Number 30, Jurassic Park Danger. In recent years, Ravensburger have shown quite a talent for acquiring excellent IPs and then making self-contained, incredibly enjoyable games that seem to capture the theme and feel of those IPs in the way that many modern franchise-based crowdfunded games just don't. Issuing thousands of miniatures, sweeping campaigns, and boxes and boxes of expansions, Ravensburger instead publishes compact titles that condense the best elements of the IP into a quick playing family experience. We've already had Alien, Fate of the Nostromo on the list, and Jaws, while excellent, didn't quite make it into the top 50. But here at number 30, we have Jurassic Park Danger. One player controls the dinosaurs in the park and gets to move awesome wooden dinosaurs around while making roaring noises. The other players control characters from the first movie, each of which has a unique deck of action cards and a special personal goal to achieve. The goals and action cards make each character unique, ensuring they play in a way that's thematic to their character in the movie, and the card play itself is very interesting, with players selecting actions in secret as they run, climb, and sneak around the island in an attempt to complete their goals and make it to the helicopter. Meanwhile, the dinosaur player gets to do everything in their power to eat the characters. When a character dies, the player takes on a new character to continue playing, but it's a point to the dinosaurs. Three kills, and the dinosaurs win. It takes a little time to explain the rules and for people to get familiar with the card play, but once everyone is up to speed, it plays quickly and can be incredibly tense. Number 29, Alien vs Predator, The Hunt Begins. I don't know why I like this one as much as I do. It's a clunky mess, really. The rules are all over the place, they are fiddly and a little bloated for what they are doing, and yet, I do love this game. The theme is obviously part of that, we are talking about some of my favourite sci-fi creatures of all time here, but even so, there is something about the game that I find so endearing, something almost archaic, nostalgic. This is an incredibly detailed board game, trying to capture all aspects of the franchise, and Prodos Games published a lot of expansion content for it. I have a whole crate of stuff, including an alien queen, power loader, pred alien, predator hunting dogs, different strains of aliens and predators, artificial persons, Wayland yutani commandos, and even characters from the Alien vs Predator arcade game. The game itself is played on a board, but each board tile is one space, so there's no real grid for movement, and everything is geared around having three teams battling it out across these cardboard arenas, the predators, the aliens, and the humans. Each team has unique goals and ways to achieve those goals, and everything you would expect to be in an Aliens game is here, burning through the hull with acid blood, getting grabbed by a facehugger and birthing a new alien, concealed units where only their size and movements are disclosed with ping tokens, closing off air vents to prevent ambushes, and much more. With expansions, it's even possible to build unique teams, and replayability becomes almost infinite. Sadly, Disney acquiring Fox brought the game to a screeching halt, shortly after the first Big Box expansion. It's a shame, because this is a game I would have kept on collecting indefinitely. Number 28, Santorini. When it comes to strategy games with a table presence, few compare to Santorini. Players control cute little builders who move around a grid making buildings. The buildings are realized in 3D with stacking plastic pieces that you can cap with a dome when they are finished. Builders can hop and build between levels that are one above or one below their current level, and the aim is simply to create buildings in such a way that they can scale to the third level of a tower that doesn't have a dome on it. I like this one for the incredible presentation, the simplicity of the gameplay, and the fact they added in god powers. You can introduce these into a game to give each player a unique special ability that will completely change how the game plays. I'm not sure all of the powers are equally balanced, but it adds so much replayability to a fun little brain burner. Number 27, Camel Up. Camel Up is a very enjoyable racing and gambling game with super simple rules, but engaging gameplay that keeps you involved and thinking all the time. The idea is simply to predict the winners and losers in a camel race while doing everything in your power to throw the race in your favor. You only have a choice of a few actions on your turn, so there isn't a lot to learn, and the way the camels stack on top of each other and move randomly by dice roll 
means trying to make a good prediction isn't easy. We also have the game Ready Steady Worm from River Horse Games in our collection, which has some similarities to Camel Up, but Camel Up does it all so much better. Number 26, Lost Cities. We have our second Kinesia game on the list. Lost Cities was one of the first games I bought when I got back into gaming. After the success of Dracula, I looked at the Cosmos line for other titles and picked up Odin's Ravens and Lost Cities. Odin's Ravens, incidentally, narrowly missed a spot on this list. Lost Cities is a simple two-player card game. You have a deck comprising suits of cards in five colours, representing five expeditions, and the idea is to lay them out in front of you in ascending order. The more cards you have in a sequence, the more points it's worth. The problem is, if you start a sequence of cards, until it gets to a certain length, it's worth negative points, so you don't want to start a sequence unless you are confident you can score points with it. Of course, as you are sharing a deck with your opponent, you have to keep an eye on what they are doing, trying to glean clues on which colours they are searching for so you can go for different suits, or better yet, screw them over by holding on to colours they want. At the end of the day, you're just trying to put numbered cards in order, but like with many Kinesia games, it plays much better than it sounds. I used to have the Lost Cities board game as well, which played in a similar manner, and while it was okay, I decided it wasn't worth keeping around for the amount it got played. The card game, on the other hand, has stood the test of time. Number 25, Blitz Bowl. It's time for another Games Workshop title, and this is one I'm very lucky to have. Due to Games Workshop's distribution plans for their Bookshelf Games series, Blitz Bowl has never been available in the UK, but I'm lucky enough to have amazing viewers who sometimes send me nice things. Blitz Bowl was one such donation, and I am so happy to have it in my collection. As you might imagine, Blitz Bowl is a fantasy sports game, the little brother to Blood Bowl. It's actually much quicker, slicker, easier to learn and teach, and easier to play than Blood Bowl. In fact, I haven't played Blood Bowl since acquiring Blitz Bowl, and I don't think I ever will. Blitz Bowl is just a perfect, compact game with everything you need to play in the box. They even included loads of cards for extra teams and balls, providing hours of replayability. In September of 2022, a new edition of Blitz Bowl, Blitz Bowl Ultimate Edition, is coming to retail, but once again, it has been region locked and is not available in the UK. This is a game that needs to be available to everyone, everywhere. Get on it, Games Workshop. Number 24, Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. Anyone who follows my channel will know that for me, board games are bound into my personality. They're important to me in a way that goes beyond something to pass the time. They have helped me through tough times, they have helped me to make new friends and become more comfortable in social situations, they have given me an outlet for my creativity, and so much more. As a result, it's not uncommon for a particular game to become important to me personally. Arkham Horror is one of those games. I don't consider it to be great, it's fiddly, takes too long to set up, takes a long time to play, is prone to devolve into chaotic noise, can become frustrating if the stars don't align for your characters, and it doesn't capture the true essence of the Lovecraftian theme. But it was the first big box game I bought when I got back into gaming. Prior to Arkham Horror, I had been playing games like Dracula and Odin's Ravens, but I saw previews of this huge box of Lovecraftian horror and eagerly pre-ordered it. I had to wait quite some time for it, but it was totally worth it. I played it with my wife, before she was my wife, all the time. We would set aside a day to drop ourselves into the game and explore its wonderful randomness, or play it late into the evenings when we were trying to save money for a wedding and a house and couldn't afford to hit the town. I really don't think I need to tell anybody about the game or how it works here. I'm sure most people have at least heard of this game or one of its other editions, each of which has been rather different actually. It's a big, unwieldy beast, like an aquatic eldritch thing with flailing tentacles that only occasionally breaks the surface to show its true awesomeness. And I love it. I love it for being another page in the story of not only the development of my hobby, but of my life. I have never felt the need to expand it. I don't even play it that often anymore, but I could never get rid of it. It would be like cutting memories straight out of my brain. Number 23. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Not so much a board game as a puzzle, 
Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is one of the cleverest titles you will find in my top 50. It's a solo or cooperative experience where the players are presented with one of 10 mysteries to solve. You have a description of the crime, and from there, you pretty much have to rely on your own deductive skills. Armed with a map of London, some newspapers filled with seemingly irrelevant stories, and a book of addresses, you have to engage your brain because the game's afoot. With very little to go on except what you deem might be important from the limited information you started with, you have to try to figure out what happened and why. As an added incentive to get a move on, you are up against Sherlock Holmes himself. You're never going to crack the case before he does, but maybe you can earn his respect. The fascinating thing about the game is how it absolutely refuses to hold your hand. You will have to consult a map, calculate how long it would take someone to walk from one place to another, scour newspapers for hints, and more. Maybe you will see the address of a shop in an advertisement, now located on the map. Was it near the crime scene? Would the owner have seen something? Would the shop have been open at the time the murder happened? When you visit certain locations, you will be directed to read extracts from the booklet for the particular crime you are solving. Perhaps you will find a clue or another red herring. It's up to you to work it out. And it's brilliant. Cracking open a bottle of red wine, pondering news stories, and arguing with my wife as we dissect the crime scene really is a lot of fun. And when something clicks, when you realize if the body was found here, but the gun was fired from there, then it means the victim was walking that way and probably knew the murderer. You sure do feel clever. Well, at least until Sherlock points out you could have solved the crime much more easily if only you'd been paying attention. Number 22, Tash Kalar. Tash Kalar is a strategy game for two to four players and it's really, really good. Each player has a deck of cards depicting patterns of tokens. On their turn, they can add tokens to the board or they can play cards if they have tokens on the board matching the patterns on those cards, including reversed and inverted forms of the pattern. Nice and simple. But this isn't simple. Each card triggers a special ability that will reshape the board, and those actions may in turn lead to the destruction of enemy pieces. The aim is to dominate, with different game modes included for chasing objectives or simply destroying opponent pieces. It's a game that sounds rather uninteresting when you explain it, but it's an absorbing, engaging experience. Trying to form those patterns you need, trying to determine what patterns your opponent is trying to make, racing an opponent to summon one of the legendary characters that's accessible to everyone, or using a flare to try to reshape the board because you're falling behind. There's so much to think about, and of course, the artwork is astounding. I am particularly fond of Tash Kalar because I had a small hand in the first two expansions. I was involved as a playtester and got my name in the rules booklets for each of them. But best of all, after submitting my feedback, I received an email from the designer, Vlada Svatl himself. He was so nice and humble and seemed genuinely interested in what I had to say as we conversed for a while. Indeed, there are ghosts of suggestions I made evident in those expansions. They are but vague images now, distorted as they bubbled up through the think tank and came into contact with various other suggestions. But they're there. Number 21, Moonstone. Longtime viewers will know I've talked about Moonstone numerous times. It's a wonderful, whimsical tabletop skirmish game with some of the best miniatures I own. The game has a really interesting central mechanism using a deck of cards and bluffing to pull off special powers. Funnily enough, it was this mechanism that originally stopped me from getting involved with the game, as games with secret information and hands of cards are generally quite difficult to play solo. But I had a chance to try the game, and I fell in love with it. So much so, I broke my own self-imposed ban on backing crowdfunding campaigns to chip in for a copy of the first supplement book they released. This game just has it all. A great theme, beautiful artwork, fantastic miniatures, and really solid gameplay. And it's an indie game put together by people with a real passion who are absolutely knocking it out of the park. And these are people who really just want you to play their game. So much so, they have put the rules, all the cards, and even artwork for standees on their website for free download. Absolutely everything you need to print and play the game for yourself. Of course, once you've tried it, you won't be able to resist those gorgeous miniatures. 
And that is that. We reached the end of the third video in this five part series. I hope you will join me next time as we count down from 20 to 11. Let me know in the comments what you think so far and what you are expecting to see next. And hopefully I will see you soon. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully I will see you all again very soon. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye.